Welcome to Congressional Connector TV with your host, Congressman Sandy Levin. I will head home and look family straight in the eye and say the federal government is on your side, providing support during this downturn and making key investments for the future. And now here's your host, Congressman Sandy Levin. Thank you for joining me. I'm fortunate to be joined today by three guests who are experts, real experts, on health care and on issues facing seniors. They are a longtime friend of mine, former Congresswoman Barbara Kennelly of the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, who fought so hard to preserve Social Security, and now it's Medicare's turn. And also Nora Super of the AARP, we all know what those initials stand for. Often in this town, we have to spell out, but I think in this case, everybody's going to know it. And Joe Baker of the Medicare Rights Center. Our topic today is so important, seniors and health care reform. There's been vigorous debate, as there should be, over health care reform. Health care affects all of us and our families, and it's important for all of us to understand how the reforms might affect us. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of distortion, and also there have been a lot of misrepresentations. So today we're going to get into the facts and talk specifically about health care, how health care reform will impact seniors. We'll talk about three subjects. So let's start with one that we talk about all the time in the Congress, and that is we know there will be some cost savings in this health care reform. Part of the expense of it will be by reducing the rate of inflation, by trying to bring health care costs under better control. But there are some who say that's going to be off the backs of seniors, I think very mistakenly. So let's talk about that. Who wants to kick it off? I'll, I'll start, Sandy. I, I'll start, Congressman. Sandy. Uh, the status quo will not hold for seniors. Uh, the, the way health care expenses are going up, 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 the status quo for seniors cannot stand as it is today, and so they have to have health care reform in relation to health care reform across the board. If we don't do it across the board, seniors will be priced right out of, of, of health care. And so I tell my seniors, and by the way, I have four million plus members, and I, and I tell them, you've got to do health care reform with Medicare reform. The two of them have to be together. Otherwise, guess what? Medicare will be priced out. There's a danger in a certain number of years it would become insolvent. Right? Insolvent, exactly, exactly. And uh, seniors don't understand this. As you well know, Congressman, they're saying taking $5 billion out of, out of uh, Medicare to, to have health care reform. The point is not that. The point is that we're going to reform the whole system. And if we can't take uh, roughly a little money out and, and reform the system, then we, we should be able to try to do what we're trying to do. I it's really to save Medicare, isn't it? Not well, I think that's true? part of it. I think yeah. it does make the Medicare program more sustainable over time. It does add years to the trust yeah. fund. Um, <clears throat> and I think as well, what we're talking really here about is not cuts to people in the original Medicare program or, to, or increases in costs, but really um, slowing down future payments, right. increases in payments to a variety of providers in the Medicare program. Many of these providers have stood with Congress, have stood with the President and said, we can make this sacrifice in the Medicare program because we can make it up in productivity gains or we're going to make it up in the fact that we're going to have people under 65 insured and paying full freight now. So many of the providers, including hospitals and others, are saying, we can do this, we can make this sacrifice in the Medicare program because we'll make it up elsewhere, and we believe that we can do this without affecting the quality and quantity of care that we're providing to people with Medicare. And maybe even improve the quality. No? I, it certainly can improve, I think, the efficiency, and part of quality is efficiency as well as effectiveness. So I think that uh, this is something that is good for the Medicare program. I think it's been spun by others as something that is, you know, dire consequences will result. I think the other point to make is 
you know, we did some Medicare cost containment in the Balanced Budget Act back in 1997. Um, and, you know, the sky didn't fall in then. And to the extent that there were things that were unintended consequences, Congress had time to come back and fix it. Much of what we're doing with Medicare in this bill, and there were a variety of bills, is changing things over a number of years. And some so, of the changes won't take effect for a number of exactly, years. Exactly, right? exactly. And so Congress and the President, others will have an opportunity to say, oh, well, we thought it might work out this way. Let's step back and change. So I don't think there's anything in this bill, um, in the House bill, certainly, um, and on the savings side, even in the Senate bill, that are uh, provide dire consequences for people no, with but Medicare. But the point is, if we continue <clears throat> to have inflation in Medicare to the point we have inflation right now, nobody can afford it. And so we have to uh, absolutely look at the whole health care picture and have the inflation go down. Uh, what, we're co what we're spending on health care is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And so what we have to do is have the reform for the whole system, including Medicare. And Medicare can only prosper by that. So we can sustain the benefits in original Medicare and, and, and save money at the same time. That's really, isn't that what yeah. this is all about? I just wanted to make a, a couple of points on that because, you know, we hear a lot from our members about this question because, as you mentioned, sure. a lot of people have been talking about all the savings in Medicare and, you know, they say, how can ARP support something like this? It's taking so much out of the Medicare program. And, you know, as Mrs. Canelli was saying, it's, it's that we think a lot of these savings are really um, important, will improve the Medicare program overall, because as we look at it, and first of all, we've been looking closely at the Medicare Advantage program for a long time. There have been recommendations that have been put out by both the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission and the Congressional Budget Office, stating that we've been overpaying those plans for quite some time. Um, you know, excess subsidies that are going to private insurance companies, that we think those payments can be reinvested in the Medicare program and given to all the Medicare beneficiaries so that they can get a lot of the benefits that just as folks that maybe are in the Medicare Advantage plans can get right now, but could be used more efficiently so people can get them, preventive health care benefits, um, other things that are in the bills for, for all uh, Medicare beneficiaries. There's also something that Congress is looking at, trying to reduce readmissions. We're talking about quality health care. No one wants to go back into the hospital if they don't have to. You know, we want to hold uh, hospitals more accountable so that they don't get infections. and So and people don't go home and then have to come back in Absolutely. immediately. Absolutely. And there's a way to do that better, is there not? There really is. And so that's a lot of the savings that we're looking for are ways that, you know, Congress has been listening to experts like the Medicare Advisory Commission, Payment Advisory Commission telling them, you know, these are ways that some of these providers, you know, could be more um, efficient, produce higher quality results, uh, ways that they're doing it better in other parts of the country and say, you know, we could do this in a more efficient way where you not only get higher quality but at lower cost. And it's not just in Medicare, but let's be a leader for the rest of the country. Yeah, so. And not, not only that, Sandy, your bill, the House bill is a good bill. I mean, it looks at the donut hole. I mean, the donut hole, who ever right. thought that up? We, we, <laughs> we know, but anyway, yeah. forget <laughs> that. But well, let's explain <laughs> the donut hole because uh, it's not breakfast time and donuts aren't <laughs> yeah, uh, no, what, what, what do we mean by that the donut what, what, what we mean is Seniors, you, you, I think you know hit a this. certain point we've spent so much and then uh, Medicare does not help, help cover you and, and then prescription drugs, prescription drugs. It, right. Right. Prescription drugs. Right. and, then, and <coughs> then, you, then you eventually get out of the donut hole but it's harder and harder to get out of the donut nice. hole and not only that what your bill does is it, it, it gives a 50% uh, discount for uh, drugs and so that that's that's a help and it, it has negotiation powers that the people can negotiate on drugs and also it helps low-income people you know low-income yeah. people get sick and when you have no ability to pay low-income people are helped by your bill I think the house bill is a marvelous bill will, you, will it will it happen I don't know but I, yeah, I we're gonna we're gonna yeah, you're, you're gonna, go, you're yeah, gonna go for it you're gonna go for it so let's talk a little further and and I think we need to come back to the points that you raised just a bit longer because I want to look everybody who's watching this in the eye and talk about this argument about about uh, share cost savings mm -hmm. You know, uh, my belief is that millions and millions of families, thousands, tens of thousands in the district I represent, have had personal experience with the present fee structure. Mm -hmm. It's not intelligent, 
and it's not intelligible. We get all these bills. Sometimes they say they're not bills, they're statements. And it's hard, they come late, and they're often based on an outmoded information technology system because, as you all know, most hospitals today don't have a modern system. They're still inscribing records by hand. So part of the cost savings maybe will come from the money that we've begun to put into information technology. You know, the experience our family had was that, that physicians would come in, they'd have to read these handwritten records, sometimes intelligible, sometimes not, hurry, and it's hard to make uh, care work, mm -hmm. right? To coordinate, mm -hmm. to coordinate the care. And so I think people, we need to convince people that there can be savings and make this system more efficient, not to cut benefits, but to make it more efficient and to save Medicare. I think that's to exactly save what it, it does, this bill, the we House We worked bill. on saving Social Security. Congressman, as, and, you, as and you, you were chair, chair of the Social Security You Subcommittee well bill. know our health care system now is so incredibly expensive for people. It's almost, they can't have it. And you have the chance now, and I know you voted for the bill the way it is. You have a chance to make it better. And, you know, I don't understand what's happening with all these special interests. But, you know, we've got to say no to the special interests. We've got to say no to the pharmaceutical companies. We've got to say no to the insurance companies. We have to say, guess what? Americans need to be able to take care of their health. And you know what? You're on the right track. You absolutely are. And, uh, and I think you're exactly right mm -hmm. about, you know, the, these opportunities to do electronic prescribing, mm -hmm. um, opportunities to use information technology, ways that we can avoid medical errors, you know, if we can allow the hospitals to communicate with the nursing homes, to communicate with people's doctors, I mean, there are provisions in the bill to, you know, give funding to physicians' offices to set up medical homes so they can coordinate. And, and, and we explain hear what from a medical a, home is. Well, so there's some provisions that would allow uh, doctors' offices to set up an, an opportunity to better coordinate people's care. We hear so much from our members about um, the ability, you know, if everyone can relate to this. If you go into the hospital, if you get any kind of illness, your um, internist probably doesn't speak to your cardiologist or doesn't exactly. speak to your oncologist. And or may not have privileges at the hospital right. you're in, Exactly, right? and people are filling out the same forms over and over again. They're, they're taking duplicative medications that often sometimes may not be, you shouldn't be taking it together. How many times have you heard stories from people that bring in paper bags full of their medications and dump them out and say, I don't know what these all are, what they do. What these electronic records can do is allow people to have them all filed so that we make sure people aren't making errors, that the physicians know everything that people are on, so that people actually, you know, have a lot of um, health problems just because of the medications they're on. Often they don't know, you know, that they had a, um, you know, sometimes they're, they're, they're in the hospital simply because of the drug interactions. Right. So we could avoid costs just because of that, just because of allowing the physicians to know, you know, this person has been taking this medication for this time. They shouldn't be on that medication because they have this kind of condition. So we could save money just by doing that, avoiding duplicative tests that they said, you already had that test two months ago. We don't need to do that again. So there are a lot of ways we think we can save money just by jump-starting these programs with electronic communication. Allowing That's what this is all about. I, I feel so <laughs> deeply about this. The purpose, contrary to some of the propaganda, and it's that it isn't to cut benefits, it's to make Medicare work better. Right. And we can do that. That's why we're so determined to have health care reform. The status quo, you said this is not workable. Okay. Well, you began to talk, uh, Barbara, well, you and I call each other by our first names, about the improvements in the bill. So let's talk a bit about, you mentioned some of them, but let's talk about the other improvements, some of them affecting near seniors, etc. You mentioned right. some of them, but 
Let's talk about others, pre-existing conditions. Well, I think spell them out. Barbara, you know, did a very good list, and that is elimination of the donut hole. The House bill does that. The Senate bill does not. No. So we really need that to, to go forward. We've got expansion of the low-income protection programs, as you mentioned as well. And also it, negotiation. Mm -hmm. And negotiation with pharmaceuticals and others around, you know, lower drug prices. So really, once again, trying to get the biggest buck for our, for our dollar. And I think... You know, one of the things that we've been talking about, not only with the coordination, but also um, is the investment in doctors. Uh, you know, one of the things that this bill, the House bill, really does is make a significant investment in primary care physicians, geriatricians, pediatricians, those doctors that are really there on the front lines, um, and that seniors and others who access the health care system really need in their corner. And this bill not only, you know, preserves their reimbursement, but also provides bonuses to to do the kind of care coordination that we've been talking about and that we all know is so important to be done. And that care coordination is not going to happen at an insurance company or you know, some other third party. It's going to happen in your doctor's office. And through this bill, we'd start to pay doctors to do that. And I think that's an incredible step forward and something that really will redound to the benefit not only of physicians, hopefully, but of their patients and particularly seniors since they, they you know, use uh, physicians and the healthcare system generally uh, disproportionately. And so I just I think want to pick up important. on something Joe said, and I know, <coughs> Congressman, you want to move on to improvements, but I think it's important for your constituents to know that if we don't get health care reform this year, the doctors in Medicare are going to face a 21 percent cut. And oftentimes what we're hearing is, oh, they're going to cut Medicare, they're going to cut Medicare. But really what this bill does is make sure that a lot of doctors are going to be paid fairly exactly. in Medicare and stay in the Medicare program. And a lot of folks on Medicare are hearing from their doctors, I may not be able to stay on Medicare unless they give me sustainable payment that I know that I can stay in the Medicare program. So I totally agree with what Joe's saying. There's important improvements that pay our primary care physicians, you know, people's internists and other people that they rely on for their primary care, but it's critically important that we fix the physician payment system so that our, you know, folks can rely on their doctors in the Medicare program. And this is a critical investment yeah. in Medicare. And we're going to do that. We've had to do it every year. Those cuts were put in there in the wee hours. <laughs> I in, remember. in a closed room uh, <laughs> by a few people uh, because they needed to find some money for That's some it. other purpose. Yeah. I don't even remember. The bill came yeah. to us out of the dark. This bill, we've talked about these bills, and there'll be one bill in the Senate, one bill in the House. We have to put them together. Sure. But Sandy, we've talked a lot about these. This is now more and more an open process. And the physician reimbursement is one of the... Uh, were you the on the committee in 94? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I sure was. And you voted for it. 94. Yeah, 94. We voted. He and I voted for it to our peril, let's <laughs> face it. And, uh, you know, we were right then and we're right right now. We have to have health care reform. We absolutely have to. Th these people that say it's the best system in the world, yeah, if you're wealthy, it's the best system in the world. But if you're a regular person, it's not the best system. But it has... I think we all agree some amazing strengths. Sure. It also has some major weaknesses. And what we're trying to do is to uh, to address the weaknesses. Mm -hmm. address Absolutely. The, all right, the I want to ask you, you all have been on television, you've been on a lot of radio shows, you've been through this debate now for months and months. If you had to name what you think, pick out one myth that you have heard about uh, about Medicare, especially as it relates to seniors that uh, and health care reform as it relates to seniors. Pick out one myth that you want to say just a word about that we haven't touched or well, have to. Let me, I know one very definitely. Seniors have been told if we don't have health care reform, you'll have the status quo. That's absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. If we don't have health care reform, Medicare will be sticking out there down the line and it'll be shot at absolutely shot at. And we've got to do health care reform and Medicare reform all together. Otherwise, Medicare will not be able to be as healthy as it is that's now. So, that's so well put, yes. Barbara. We miss you in the, in the House. No, I, I, I live but this. Not, I know, <laughs> and now with all the members of the, of the committee. We like her on the outside, too. I, so. No, I, and so do I, but I miss her in, in the committee. So what, what would you pick out? Is you know, I think I would pick out that we hear that the government's going to be making decisions, they're going to be rationing your benefits. Yeah. 
-hmm. And, you know, I think that that's so unfair and untrue because we really look at the bills, we read every single page of them, as I know you do too, and all the responsible members of Congress do. And we, you know, take great effort to look at how they would be doing. And everyone's working very hard to make sure that the government doesn't have that kind of control. They're working very hard to make sure that private insurance options are going to be available to all uh, Americans so that they can choose things just like federal employees and, have. And, and just this like argument about a public option, we're trying to provide competition for the private sector, not its replacement. Exactly. It's not, it's not about the government running. It's, it's about people having choices about how to receive yeah, well their health care. Yes. And then there, for them to be able to feel secure that they actually will have a safety net there for them because people right now feel a lot of insecurity. Right. So the myth you would pick, this isn't domination. What it is is improvement of the system. Absolutely. Well, you, what myth would you? Well, I think I'm jumping off what we've been talking about and what Barbara said as well. And the biggest myth is that seniors say, there's nothing in this for me. It's all cuts. You know, Medicare is going to be cut, and so we're not getting anything. So again, the improvements. Well, I think the improvements are the, and we haven't mentioned yet, uh, you know, taking away deductibles and coinsurance on preventive care, making that, you know, free for folks. And that's an important I, I benefit. I think we have a chart. On that, don't we? Let me see if if if, uh, if, if technology works. You so wouldn't be a hey, congressman. You wouldn't be a congressman if you didn't have a chart. chart. I know, I know, <laughs> and it works. It works. I, I have a, a, a paper copy, but uh, everybody can see right. what the present copays are, right? right? And these things would become zero. Uh, mm -hmm. So folks would be able to ac access these. There would be no barriers to this preventive care. And then I think as, as Barbara and I were both mentioning, we were all mentioning the elimination of the donut hole. Um, so folks can get that. You know, we're still living in a world where people are cutting their pills in half, um, even though we have a prescription drug benefit. Or when not they, even taking them at all. Or not taking them at all, exactly. And then finally, the investments in primary care. Uh, and particularly investments in primary care physicians that go along with this preventive care investment. So there are incredible investments making the program more sustainable, and that's exactly right. You know, this, this is an historic opportunity to get health care reform and to get savings that are invested in health care reform. Because when we did the, B the Balanced Budget Act in 97, when we've done legislation in the past, we've taken savings from the Medicare program, and it's gone elsewhere. Yes, Here we're taking savings and we're taking efficiencies and we're doing it the right way. I should say you're doing it the right way. And we're all doing, uh, it, we're all doing it together. And we're reinvesting that money in the health care system, both in Medicare and for folks under 65. And if we bolster the health care system, seniors win uh, because they use the health care system more than anybody else. For sure. Well said. Thank for you. sure. Well said. No, I think you, you put your finger on some critical misconceptions. You know, on this, uh, when we do this uh, program, what I like to do is to read mail. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to go to the mailbag, and I want to read this from um, Sandra. Maybe it's Sandy, like I am, from Hazel Park. And this is what she writes. I have never written a public official before, but this time I am quite uh, upset over the Medicare, the medical care bill. It has come to my attention that on page 425 of this bill that euthanasia will be made legal. This is unconscionable. Well, who wants to address that? Uh, I, I think I'm old enough to address that. I, th I, I think I'm old enough. And, and Look, it, all of us have a choice. Uh, we can write a will or make our uh, uh, opinion known to our family of what, what we want when we get sick. And that is not in the bill. It absolutely is not in the bill. And the people that have said it is in the bill are, are just you evil. You say uh, euthanasia. Yeah, no, but you know what you, you should, uh, euthanasia it, it, is killing. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. Well, essentially, w right, what the bill says is, if you want an if you want to have an advanced directive or a living will, yeah, right? Yeah, right? A living if will. You, if you want to have le have instructions, it's totally voluntary. Right. That there'll be a payment to a physician if you want to consult. If you want to consult that pay, uh, physician, a modest payment. But it, Sandy, that's the Sandy, opposite you, of euthanasia, right? It's, Sandy, it's if you want to have a living will, you can have a living will. Exactly. You could always have a living right. will. My husband had a living will. 
I mean, that's what you can have. There's nothing in this bill that ever says anything is mandatory. Well, exactly. you know, and we got exactly. a lot of letters and calls from our members at AARP as well on this question. And, you know, we were supportive of, of the provisions that actually talked about advanced directive and, and, and paying doctors for these counseling sessions because just like Ms. Canelli said, just as people can go to get a living will or go to get an advanced directive, often they'll go to their lawyer to get that information because you want some legal help. What a lot of people would like is to talk to their doctor about these decisions before they're actually in a time of crisis. So they want to be able to talk to their doctors about, you know, you know, what if I had a disease or what if I had a decision? What are the different options that I have? And so what doctors and many other health professionals have told us is, you know, we just want the opportunity to be able to have time. How many times have all of us experienced or any of our uh, family members have said, doctors always seem like they're in a hurry? Well, that's because, like what we said before, our medical system isn't set up in such a way that we're reimbursing physicians to sit down and spend time. Exactly. And, I, and I think, that's you know, what we were saying before, we want to move to a system that rather than paying for quantity, we want to be paying for quality. Okay, so. in terms of quality, we have two more questions. <laughs> One we can answer very quickly, and that is about uh, Medicare uh, premiums going up. We've passed legislation, right, to make sure that that doesn't happen next year. So we get to the last question, and that is about uh, veterans care. He wants to make sure that uh, the VA system and the TRICARE system uh, maintain is maintained, that we preserve the unique identity and role of, of uh, help for veterans, we're going to do that. Right? These Absolutely. bills do that. We're yeah, going to do absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's a wonderful system. Yep. And we're going we're gonna to keep Preserve it. it. Well, you know, I think our time's running out, so <laughs> I just want to thank my guests, all of you. This has gone so fast. It's so interesting. Thank you. And I want all of you to know, those of you who are listening to this program, thank all of the three panelists. And if you have any questions, I'd like you to submit them for the next show, and also you can call our local office uh, in Roseville, 586-498-7122, and thanks for joining, for watching us today, and I hope you'll come back the next time.